Hello, this is Tony Heller from RealClimateScience.com, setting the record straight about climate. In this video, I'm going to cover another example of climatologists not understanding the basics of science. Here's an article from the Chicago Tribune. The shallowest Great Lake provides drinking water for more people than any other. Algae blooms are making it toxic, and it's getting worse. This seems plausible. When I lived in Cleveland in 1963, Lake Erie was nearly dead. That was right at the start of the global cooling scare. But here's the part of the article which is troubling. Climatologists say the Great Lakes region has become soggier. A spike in greenhouse gases, largely from man-made carbon emissions, has driven global temperatures upward, according to the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. For every degree of warming, the atmosphere can hold 4% more moisture, which can translate into heavier and more severe downpours. Since 1951, the Great Lakes region has seen a 2.3 degree rise in temperatures, a 14% uptick in annual precipitation, and a 35% increase in the most intense storms. In the past year, the rain, snow, and flooding across the Midwest was one for the record books. This article is reasonably well written and sounds fairly credible until you actually look at the details. They're saying that global temperatures have increased. This has increased the amount of moisture in the atmosphere, and that's causing heavier and more severe downpours. The way they present it, it sounds like pretty basic science. Let's take a closer look now and see if what they're saying is true. Every time we have a dry year, climatologists say, this is exactly what we expected from global warming. And every time we have a wet year, they say, this is exactly what we expected from global warming. If we go back to the beginning of the global warming scare in summer of 1988, scientists tell Congress greenhouse effect brings drought. Scientists say Earth has warmed to record temperatures in 1988 and drought will be more likely, especially in the southeast and the midwest, unless industrial and auto emissions believed responsible are cut sharply. So in 1988, they said, we've got to cut back our greenhouse gas emissions or we're going to have really bad droughts. And in 2019, they say, we've got to cut back our greenhouse gas emissions or it's going to be too wet. Then the article goes on. In a grim presentation to the Senate Energy and Natural Resource Committee Thursday, atmospheric experts said they have a high degree of confidence. Well, if you predict every possible outcome, you can have a high degree of confidence that one of them is going to be right. And here's another prediction about the Great Lakes from 30 years ago. Global warming may cause the lake levels to fall by as much as 8 feet in the next century. And 30 years later, Great Lakes water levels are near record highs, shrinking beaches and flooding docks. And this, of course, is due to global warming. So global warming was going to make the Great Lakes dry up, and it's also causing them to flood. Climatology is such a great profession. You can never be wrong about anything. Now let's look at some of the alleged science behind their claims. This is the global temperature trend map from NASA for the winter over the last 40 years. The vast majority of the claimed global warming which has been occurring has been in the high Arctic and during winter. Over the past 40 years, the regions around the North Pole have warmed up about 5 degrees Celsius, from minus 30 degrees up to minus 25 degrees. And they're claiming that this increase in temperature has greatly increased the amount of moisture in the atmosphere. But there's a huge problem here. Air at minus 30 degrees Celsius can't hold much moisture, and air at minus 25 degrees Celsius can't hold much moisture either. Very little snow falls at those temperatures because the air is so dry. Most snow falls at minus 10 C or higher. The Chicago Tribune said, for every degree of warming, the atmosphere can hold 4% more moisture. That's a general statement which is meaningless because the vast majority of the warming was in the Arctic winter. Every region has its own climate. The average global temperature has little or no meaning when considering regional weather patterns. Well, we've heard the junk science. Now let's look at what's really going on with temperatures and precipitation around the Great Lakes. This graph shows the average daily maximum temperature at all of the Great Lakes states going back to 1895. You can see that afternoon temperatures around the Great Lakes have declined rather sharply over the past century, and that the Great Lakes states had much warmer afternoon temperatures prior to 60 years ago. Now let's go back and look at the Chicago Tribune article again. They said, since 1951, the Great Lakes region has seen a 2.3 degree rise in temperatures. So why did they choose to start their trend in the 1950s? Well, that's an easy question to answer. They cherry-picked the 1950s start date because the Great Lakes region was much warmer prior to that. 
They're doing the standard climatology trick of hiding all the data which wrecks their theory. This is the same graph showing average mean temperatures instead of average maximum temperatures. As you can see, the long-term trend is still downwards. But by cherry-picking a start date right here, they're able to show an upwards trend, which is not at all indicative of the climate of the Great Lakes region. And this upward trend in mean temperatures since the 1950s is largely due to milder nighttime temperatures, particularly in the winter. Summers, on the other hand, have gotten much cooler. This graph shows the percent of days above 90 degrees Fahrenheit at all Great Lakes states, going back to the year 1895. Once again, you can see that the frequency of hot days has plummeted by more than 50%, and that the Great Lakes region was much hotter prior to 60 years ago. And here's the same graph for 95 degree days. They almost never happen anymore, but they were pretty common prior to 60 years ago. The Chicago Tribune article was claiming that it was wet in the Midwest this year because the air was warm and it was holding more moisture, but that simply isn't true. This is NOAA's map for the departure from normal temperature for the year to date. Most of the U.S. has been below normal temperature, including the Midwest and most of the Great Lakes states. And none of the Great Lakes states have had temperatures much above normal. Now let's look at the precipitation map. The patterns have been very similar. The places that were cold had a lot of moisture, and the places that were warm had less moisture. I put the two maps side by side. You can see that the coldest places were also the wettest, and that the warmest places were also the driest. It appears that cold is associated with wet, and warm is associated with dry. Let's look at this in a lot more detail. This graph shows the November 1st to October 31st of the following year, average maximum temperature at all United States Historical Climatology Network stations. Once again, you can see that afternoon temperatures were much warmer in the United States prior to 60 years ago. And note that 1934 was the hottest year by far. I will be referring back to this later. And this graph of the percent of days over 90 degrees also shows that U.S. summers used to be much hotter. And the same graph for the percent of 95 degree days, which are down nearly 50% since the 1930s. Now let's look at the trend in precipitation in the United States. The U.S. has been getting wetter over the past 60 years, with this year being the wettest on record. Now let's go back and look at the maximum temperature graph. Afternoon temperatures over the past 12 months have been fourth coolest on record in the United States. And as we just saw in the previous graph, it's also been the wettest year on record in the United States. Another big hint that cold and wet go together. So this is the really important graph. Along the x-axis is average maximum temperature at all United States Historical Climatology Network stations, and along the y-axis is average precipitation. This graph has one blue dot for every year going back to 1896. The trend shows very clearly that cooler years tend to be wetter years and that warmer years tend to be drier. The wettest year was 2019 and was also the fourth coolest year. But at the other end of the spectrum, the warmest year was 1934 and was also the driest. Looking at the temperature graph again, we can see that 1934 had by far the warmest afternoon temperatures on record in the United States. And no surprise, 80% of the country was in drought during the summer of 1934. That led to extremely hot temperatures. The soils were so dry that year that most of the U.S. turned into a virtual desert. And deserts are well known for getting hot in the afternoon. Now let's compare that to the equivalent map for this year. This year has been extremely wet in the United States, and the wet weather has been associated with cool temperatures. It should be pretty obvious by now that the claim warmer temperatures produces more precipitation is simply not true. Alaska is the second wettest state in the United States, and it's also the coldest state. By contrast, Arizona is one of the hottest states in the country, and it's also one of the driest. This claim in the article that warmer temperatures produces more precipitation is simply nonsense. Let's read the sentence again. For every degree of warming, the atmosphere can hold 4% more moisture. That statement is true, but precipitation falls when the atmosphere can't hold the moisture, not when it can. We get precipitation when a cold front comes through because colder air can't hold the moisture, so it falls as precipitation. Warmer air can hold the moisture, so we don't get the precipitation. Their thinking is exactly backwards. 
Years when we get a lot of precipitation like this year tend to be years when we're getting a lot of cold fronts passing through. And years with fewer cold fronts tend to be dry. During January of 2016, Michael Mann of Penn State University and Kevin Trenberth of the National Center for Atmospheric Research put their ignorance on display. They claimed that the heavy snowstorms that month in the Northeast were due to an excess of moisture in the atmosphere. Michael Mann's bottom line, while critics like to claim that these massive winter storms are evidence against climate change, they're actually favored by climate change. But they had no idea what they were talking about. This is the NOAA map of the percent of normal precipitation for the Northeast during January of 2016. As you can see, precipitation over most of the region was well below normal. The heavy snow is due to the fact that there was a lot of cold air coming down from Canada. Cold air can hold as much moisture, so as dropping the precipitation in the form of very dry snow. Every child in the world who lives in snowy regions knows that snow falls when it's cold, but climatologists don't seem to understand that. Climate scientists are always talking out of both sides of their mouth. In 1995, the IPCC said global warming jeopardizes the skiing industry. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, a group of scientists from 120 countries, said Tuesday that global warming may be reducing the world's snowfall and jeopardizing the skiing industry in many countries. And they said the same thing again in 2003. Global warming threatens skiing. From Whistler to Kitzbühel, Austria and beyond, ski resorts around the world are being warned in a new United Nations study that global warming will put many operators out of business within decades. In their 2001 report, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change said milder winter temperatures will decrease heavy snowstorms. And 20 years ago, David Viner from the Climatic Research Unit in England said that children just aren't going to know what snow is. But all their predictions were wrong. We're seeing record snowfall. Ski areas are opening up record early in the fall, and they're closing record late in the summer. Ski season here in Colorado used to be about four months a year, and now it's more like eight months. Climatologists are consistently wrong because their theories are based around superstitions about greenhouse gases. And no matter what the weather is, they blame it on greenhouse gases. This is a religion, not a science. Visit Toto on the web at realclimatescience.com. He's been pulling back the curtain on junk science and propaganda for a long time.